So let's do a quick um, jumping in where we left off last week. We talked all about snakes and their evolution last week and uh, all kinds of uh, different elements of their biology, their physical adaptations. But I want to give a quick rundown of all the snakes that live here in New Hampshire, because these are the ones that uh, if you live in the, anywhere in New England, you're, these are going to be your backyard snakes or the ones you're going to find when you're out hiking. So I definitely want to give you guys a good rundown of what they are and how to recognize them. Um, and why aren't you? Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's move right along here. Uh, we talked about snake taxonomy. I'm going to quickly move through that about what reptiles are, how, how they're, you know, fitting into the, the kingdom of life. So I'm going to quickly move through that. We talked about our modern snakes and what makes them all similar. Um, and snake families, we mentioned briefly. We have the Colubridae, which is most snakes you find. In fact, pretty much every snake we're going to talk about today is in the Colubridae family. So all these harmless snakes, I mean, traditionally we've called them non-venomous. As we mentioned last week, we, there is some new research about how a lot of uh, snakes do have some degree of toxicity in their saliva. So it's a little bit, you know, maybe uh, complex to say venomous versus non-venomous now. But really, these are the most common groups of snakes you'll find. Garter snakes and milk snakes and all of our common familiar snakes are in this group. Um, and we do have one viper that is uh, traditionally was living in New Hampshire, um, and it has been all but um, driven to extinction. We'll talk a little bit about that today, the timber rattlesnake. Um, so these are, these are snakes that have the fangs, the two fangs that can deliver venom, and also includes copperheads and water moccasins when you go farther south in the eastern U.S., and then elapids, elapidae are the cobra family. So that includes cobras. And here in North America, that includes coral snakes. That is our most familiar elapid. So they don't have the fangs that spring out like the vipers do. They have kind of fixed fangs in their, their skull, but can still be incredibly venomous, as uh, I'm sure you probably know, uh, thinking about coral uh, snakes. And, um, you know, some of the most venomous snakes in the world, actually, some sea snakes are elapids. So uh, not to be trifled with, but uh, not as common in North America as vipers are. Um, there's a milk snake there. And then we also have, you know, pythons, um, which are uh, constrictors. They're more of a tropical group. They are actually living in the old world. So um, kind of move on to New Hampshire snakes. I'm getting caught up again on my PowerPoint here. We got boas, other constrictors there. Just run down major snake families. We're going to focus on Colubridae today because that is where all these familiar snakes are found here we're going to be talking about. So here are our snake species of New Hampshire. Some are widespread and very common and others are pretty rare to find, like this green, smooth green snake you find at the bottom of the screen there. So we've got five species that are vulnerable and endangered. Uh, you know, they're not very well studied. We don't know as much about snakes as we do about mammals and birds because there just hasn't been as much research done on them. Not as many people out in the field trying to learn about their natural history, and they're also to some degree harder to find and harder to study. So there's a lot we don't know about snakes, and we really even our native snakes here in New Hampshire, and uh, we don't quite know the full uh, story about their behaviors and about just how common or uncommon they are. So I want to just you know mention that from the get go that all this information I'm sharing is our best understanding. But even our native snakes, most of them are not all that well understood. And uh, if you want to find more details about, you know, a lot of these snakes and the, their, their status uh, in New Hampshire, which I'm going to kind of gloss over kind of during our, our presentation, the Fish and Game website for New Hampshire has a great little uh, website that I've used uh, as a resource when I've been compiling these presentations for all of our native reptile species and you know, native species of wildlife in general. So check that out if you're interested sometime. But here's our native snakes of New Hampshire we're going to run through. Our red-bellied snake, you can see that in the photo there. That's a cute little guy I caught a couple years ago. Uh, decays brown snake, another little guy. Garter snake, our most common snake. Ribbon snakes, uh, milk snakes, ring neck snakes, northern water snakes, smooth green snakes, eastern hognose snakes, and black racers, and the timber rattlesnake are all of our native snake species of New Hampshire that we have here. So let's start with the red-bellied snake. These are little guys that you can find uh, in your garden and, you know, uh, rooting around in leaf litter. They're pretty uh, common species, but again, they're pretty secretive. You don't find them unless you're really kind of looking under logs. Maybe if you're a gardener, you might have encountered one of them, uh, and they have that beautiful reddish color on their belly there. I mean, a lot of these snakes can vary in coloration. You can see these two examples here. One has a much darker upper body than the other, and you always have to remember to consider when you're trying to identify a snake uh, how old it is and the fact that there's a lot of variation in patterns. Not all snakes of the same species are going to look the same or even all that similar at all. So you got to really try to know what the common characteristics are. And for these guys, that nice kind of, you know, sort of um, uh, rusty reddish orangish belly is really a great characteristic to look for. 
and they're, they're widespread. There's a lot of them. They only get up to 10 inches max. So they are a small snake and they are munching on slugs and snails. They are kind of helping out you gardeners by getting rid of some of those pests in your garden. So they are great to have around, 100% harmless, super cute. So if you ever find one, you can gently check it out, pick it up. I did, uh, in a snake class once, help a lifelong uh, person with snake phobia, ophidiophobia, overcome their phobia with this little snake right here because they're just really easy to approach compared to some of our other larger species. So, um, again, variable colors, you know, look for that reddish belly there. Um, and here's some other pictures of the red-bellied snake. I'm gonna skip through some of these details about their, um, you know, biology. You can check that out later. And, they, I mentioned these guys are one of the ones that have the mass migration to their hibernation uh, sites in the fall. A lot of these little snakes will all gather together and hibernate in the same, you know, uh, rotting tree stumps and, you know, little shelters because those are the best places for them to be to avoid the frost. And that's why they all gather up many different uh, small snakes in New England. There's their range. You can check that out later if you want to in New Hampshire. And let's move on to another small snake, the Decay's Brown Snake. And these guys are, uh, you know, their name fits them, the brown snake. They, they have brownish coloration patterns on them uh, to help them stay camouflaged. And they're another very small and totally harmless, and I would say rather cute little snake species that is very widespread and, you know, a little bit larger than the, the red-bellied snake, up to 14 inches. Um, you can see those kind of two rows of dark spots running down their back, even though it's a bit variable as well. And here's a little uh, size <laughs> uh, comparison with a penny there. You can see how small they are when they're first hatchlings. And these guys you can find really in a lot of very urban and suburban places, you know, they can live in, you know, parking lots and, you know, um, uh, certainly your gardens and your yards. And they're, they're pretty common under, you know, debris piles, if you're moving wood, things like that, you might find one of these guys. And once again, 100% harmless, uh, very cool little snake to find out and about. Um, these guys are also eating a lot of soft invertebrates, earthworms and slugs and snails, and they're a little more generalist in their diet. They can eat all kinds of small invertebrates as well, but also a helper to the gardener, getting rid of some of those pests for you there. Let's get through some of that. Um, there's their range, not quite as widespread up in the northern regions of New Hampshire. Um, and let's move on to our, our most familiar eastern snake. I can almost guarantee every single one of you have seen this snake if you are in this class. Uh, these are, you know, just by far the most commonly encountered snake, I would say, in North America. Um, the common garter snake, Thamnopus sertalis, and, you know, really they are absolutely successful as snakes. They've inhabited um, a wide range of our continent. They're the farthest northern ranging uh, reptile species even in North America. They're, they're quite cold tolerant and even you know, when they're getting down in their hibernation chambers, they can, as we talked about, find these, these crevices even way up north where they can avoid the frost and uh, survive the winters. Um, and they're quite variable in their coloration. I, I've had a few people send me photos of snakes and say, well, what is this? And I just say, it's a, it's a garter snake. It just has a really cool, unique uh, pattern. Some of them are more checkered than others. Uh, you know, you want to look for those yellow stripes. Those are really the two to three yellowish stripes running down the back is really the most common thing. But they often have different degrees of black spots and checkering between the stripes. Um, I mentioned about the scale types uh, last week. The keeled scales, if you really want to look closely, you can see that they all have a little ridge along the scale, and that gives them kind of a rough texture. If you're holding a snake and it feels a little bit rough, it probably has keeled scales, which is a, a good diagnostic characteristic trying to identify different snake species. You can sort of read up if it has uh, either smooth or keeled scales. But um, the, also the garter snake, that red tongue is just such a good giveaway, bright red with the black tip. And, uh, you know, that's a great, great characteristic to look for, despite whatever the pattern might be. And, you know, these guys, you can see they live in a wide range of habitats, aquatic habitats, very dry habitats. They're chowing down on all kinds of things, uh, frogs and toads and earthworms. They're certainly very common in a wide range of habitats. Um, they do um, eat even um, some prey items that aren't necessarily easy for other reptiles or predators to eat. They can definitely eat crayfish even, uh, shell and all, when they get them from the back. It's all about which direction you're swallowing, right? Uh, small fish they can catch. And um, larger snakes will even get small mammals and birds. I've seen some pretty good-sized garter snakes uh, once in a while. I think the largest I saw was, was approaching five feet. And most snakes and turtles actually keep growing throughout their lives. So the bigger the specimen you find, the older it is, the longer it's been around. So uh, it can kind of give you an indication of uh, 
you know, how old it is and, and how successful it's been over the course of its lifetime when you find a really hefty specimen. Um, and these guys will even eat carry-on sometimes. They'll find something dead and uh, munch it down. And they're great swimmers. You can find them. I've seen them uh, in the middle of lakes, you know, uh, Lake New Benusit, uh near the Harris Center. Sometimes I'm out in a boat and you're saying, hey, what's that ripple in the water? There's a garter snake way out in the middle of a big lake. For whatever reason, decided it was time to cross and look for greener pastures on the other side or something. <laughs> um, all snakes can swim, by the way. Every single snake in the world, you put it in water. Even if it's a desert species, they all have that instinct and they can swim. Uh, which is pretty amazing actually kind of harkens back to probably some of their common ancestry um here's one chowing down in a bullfrog tadpole an uh, earthworm here these guys are not picky they're eating all kinds of things grasshopper uh and these guys can't eat venomous amphibians which is pretty cool uh they can eat venomous toads here in new hampshire they can eat our american toads that do have some degree of venom as well as our even the red f's those uh, bright orange um you know uh, newts that we have but are quite venomous garter snakes can't eat them and survive they're resistant to a lot of these amphibian toxins and a little cool side fact that i'll mention briefly is they've done studies on this one population of california red-sided garter snakes that's on the other side of the continent and they've actually had a sort of evolution arms race with the newts they eat and these newts are quite toxic but the snakes have evolved the resistance to their toxin which has caused the newts to become more toxic so these are like super toxic newts nowadays because they think of the pressure evolutionarily speaking of the uh, predatory impacts of these garter snakes that kept becoming resistant and able to eat them so that you know kept um, reinforcing each other's abilities over time. You see lots of ex examples of this in nature of how two species get into an arms race, they say, and build up their both their toxicity and their resistance over time. So here's one of these, by the way, this is the, I think technically this is the same species of garter snake, but it goes to show these California Western populations can look totally different in some wild colorations. Uh, so here's the, the red sided garter snake. And there's been, I think, arguments from herpetologists that say, hey, we got to break up garter snakes into different species. I mean, we call them all subspecies, but again, it's just one of those stories that's all around in science of how, how do we define a species? And, you know, at what point do we say that it's worth breaking a subspecies into actual species? And that's, a you know, nature doesn't care. <laughs> nature just does its thing and evolves into all kinds of niches and complexities. And the whole question is, could they interbreed if they met up? Well, you have to do a lot of, <laughs> you know, experimentation that people don't necessarily have time for to figure that out. But for all intents and purposes, for now, we say there's a wide range of subspecies in the garter snake, uh, clade and they're quite variable across the continent there's one chowing down on a toxic california newt there uh, th these are examples of snakes that do give uh, live birth, so they don't lay eggs. They actually have uh, what looks like, you know, live, uh, you know, babies coming out. And we talked a little bit about that last week, the three different styles of snake reproduction. And uh, quite, you know, amazingly, not all reptiles lay eggs. They can actually, um, you know, uh, harbor the babies, the mother, in their body until they hatch. And then they just break out of that membrane, that amniotic membrane we talked about. And they can have up to 70 babies, one litter, uh, one female garter snake. So uh, pretty amazing and, you know, testament to their success as a reptile across our continent. Uh, I'm going to zip ahead from all these details. We talked a little bit about their, uh, sorry, their hibernation behavior, how some of the males deceive other males with female hormones when they come out of hibernation to warm up in the spring and kind of get a little boost in their ability to uh, find a mate. So that was a pretty cool behavior we talked about. And these guys are also prey for lots of other larger predators. So you've got you know, fish and turtles and birds and uh, even bullfrogs uh, that are going to be eating garter snakes. Here's a great little heron. Um, and if, if anybody who's ever caught a garter snake, which I bet a lot of you have, you probably know about their first, uh, you know, uh, defensive mechanism they have, which is to release this very nasty smelling liquid from their anal glands. I call it getting skunked. People say getting musked as well. And I think most garter snakes I've ever caught, I, I get that smell on me. <laughs> and it, you know, it's certainly not going to hurt you, but it, but it's hard to wash off. It'll stick on you for, for a while, a few days. Um, and uh, it's just, it's a pretty effective mechanism. You know, predators don't like that smell and sometimes they can't escape when they release that nasty, funky smell from their anal glands, uh, giving them a little extra shot at surviving. And here's one of these... Um, pheromonal uh mating balls where you have i think that you know the deceptive male wrapping around another male uh or you know vice versa because he's trying to uh, get those pheromones thinks it's a female but it's heating up that deceptive male 
and we talked about all these different subspecies that have some beautiful colorations. And look, it's just all across North America, into Canada, way up north, all the way down into Central America. So a very, very successful uh, species of snake. And all over the place in New Hampshire too. <laughs> Not threatened in the slightest. Now, another species that you sometimes find here in New Hampshire that kind of looks like a garter snake, but definitely is different is the ribbon snake. Uh, I had a ribbon snake as a pet when I was a, a kid for a while, and these are super cool snakes that are much more aquatic specialists. So they are somewhat vulnerable in New Hampshire, not as common. They're very slender compared to a garter snake, and they don't have all those checkers on their scales either. They're a lot kind of more distinct looking with those stripes they have. And these guys, you know, really can look for the stripes, look for the slenderness, and the habitat as well. They are aquatic. They are going to be eating a lot of fish and tadpoles. The one that I used to have as a pet, I would just buy uh, bags of, of uh, goldfish for it. Uh, his name was Seymour. And I uh, just dump it in his, in his little bowl and he would just glomp, glomp, just swallow them one after the other really, really quickly and effectively. Uh, pretty amazing how an animal without any limbs can be a very good fish catcher. It's, it's not a simple thing and they are quite good at it. Um, so you can definitely see these guys out and about near aquatic habitats, keeping out for ribbon snakes. Moving right along here, different photos of ribbon snakes. Um, check that out later. So the eastern milk snake is uh, one of my favorite New Hampshire snakes. I showed you my pet, my well, my, she's not really a pet, but I uh, I found her and I showed you at the, the last uh, uh, Zoom session. Um, and she's outside right now. I set up a tank for her, so I'm not going to waste time going and grabbing her. But gorgeous snakes. Uh, they they are very common around human. Um, you know, homes and barns. They have their name Milk Snake because of that weird old wives' tale about how they will uh, drink milk from the cow's udder. Uh, not true. <laughs> they are mouse hunters, primarily rodent eaters, and they are helping keep your rodent population down when they're hanging around your home or your barn. And I say, you know, let them do their thing. You find one inside your basement, whatever, you let them outside. Don't do it in winter, but um, definitely just, you know, if you're comfortable with them, let them just keep on hunting mice and uh, taking care of some rodent control in your, your uh, neighborhood. Um, these guys are widespread and secure. They've got, you know, a variation of colors, but they really have that beautiful, you know, patterning of the, the reddish uh, spots, reddish brown spots, and then the grayish bodies. Um, really just a gorgeous snake. And uh, you can see that kind of checkering pattern on the belly is another distinctive thing to look for uh, on those um, ventral scales they have there. Um, often has kind of a, a Y shape on the top of the head. You can see there, uh, my, my snake Maisie, sure is her name, she definitely has that Y very distinctively. <laughs> Um, so, you know, again, you can find these guys in lots of different habitats, but keep an eye out for them around your own homes and, uh, you know, certainly in piles of wood or trash or logs around your yard. And uh, these definitely are snakes that have been mistaken a lot for a dangerous species because they're just commonly countered and, you know, they have a range of patterns and, uh, you know, lots of people have killed them because they thought they were something dangerous, which they definitely are not. So <laughs> I hope all y'all are, you know, confident you can recognize a milk snake and tell your neighbors, tell your friends, because they're, they're great snakes to have around, good to have for rodent control and 100% harmless. Uh, these guys will eat quite a lot of different prey items, not just rodents. They'll even eat you know, other snakes and amphibians, birds and eggs, fish and invertebrates. They are generalists in their uh, dietary preferences, and they do use constriction. They will wrap around their prey and um, asphyxiate them until they you know, die from lack of oxygen. And... Here's one hanging out by someone's uh, basement window there, you know, common place to find a milk snake doing its thing, basking there. Um, and here's one eating a garter snake. Just goes to show these guys will eat all kinds of prey and they will constrict and eat other snakes sometimes. Um, here's one eating, I think, uh, what is that? It's a ring neck snake it's eating, so <laughs> yeah, um, eating uh, other snakes there. But once again, I think a very beautiful snake, uh, just incredible patterns. And oh, one thing to mention about these guys, which is something that other non-venomous snakes will do, is when they're disturbed, they do go into that defensive posture, like you see the bottom one doing, you know, coiled up, which is kind of just like, hey, leave me alone. I will strike if you get near me, you know. And <laughs> sometimes these non-venomous snakes will strike. That is not, doesn't mean they're going to hurt you at all. And they will actually wiggle their tails in the dry leaves, kind of like a, uh, to mimic a rattlesnake, basically. They'll sort of, you know, uh, create that rattling sound just using whatever vegetation dead leaves are around and that unfortunately has caused a lot of these snakes to get killed by people when they think they're rattlesnakes you know it's just you know it was an evolutionary behavior designed to mimic rattlesnakes and just really just warn other creatures to leave them alone hey i don't want any trouble here you know uh leave me alone and uh 
hopefully don't eat me or step on me. And you know, that definitely, you can hear that sometimes, but it's, it's once you know what you're listening for, it doesn't sound like a rattlesnake rattle. It's just kind of this, this different rustling sound that's, that's mimicking it, which is quite cool. Um, but good to know. These guys are nocturnal. They're out at night primarily. So uh, you, know, you probably won't run into them out and about in the daytime as often. I mentioned about how they're often, uh, you know, killed by accident and lots of uh, myths surrounding them unfortunately. And they are, this is interesting, actually. They, there's a lot of, again, like we talked about, subspecies that range across the continent that are totally different looking. Look at this Mexican milk snake that is, technically speaking, the same species, Lampropeltis triangulum, but it has the subspecies annulata, which, you know, means it's a local population that it had different selection pressures. And in this case, it evolved to mimic a coral snake, uh, which is a vastly different coloration scheme than we have up here, where we don't have coral snakes in New Hampshire. But, uh, you know, the question is, if, if this met an eastern milk snake up in New Hampshire, would they breed? Would they have uh, viable offspring? I, I haven't tried that myself, but the idea is they probably would and could if we still have this, uh, you know, species designation. But again, I mean, there's lots of debate about this. And, um, you know, these guys, there's the, there's the old adage, uh, red on yellow, kill a fellow, uh, red on black, venom lack, or friend of Jack, you know, so if you're out in uh, the southern parts of the U.S. or whatever, um, you can definitely... Keep that in mind to remember if it's a milk snake or a coral snake. And really, there's a lot of snakes in, you know, when you get into the tropics that have learned to, uh, or not learned, but have evolved uh, what's called aposematic coloration, warning coloration that's actually a mimicry of venomous species. So this is a harmless snake, but it's just trying to capitalize on the fact that predators or, or um, you know, other animals recognize this coloration scheme as being dangerous. So they're just kind of benefiting from that fear and that awareness that many species have, uh, you know, about this coloration scheme that keeps them away from uh, venomous species. So anyway, you know, yes. That came in. Uh, what is, how can we be sure that we know the difference between a, a rattlesnake and a, a milk snake or? Oh gosh, okay, so I would say, we're gonna get into that, but really the most simple thing is to look at the head. If you can see the head, you can see the milk snake there, look how its head just kind of blends right in its neck. It doesn't have a big wide jaw. And generally speaking, you know, the viper, um, you know, family, which includes rattlesnakes and copperheads, they got this big triangular head that's quite a bit wider than the, the neck. And they also have, you know, I mean, this isn't, this isn't, isn't a always thing for venomous versus non-venomous. They have, you know, the sort of cat eye slit pupils versus round pupils. And, um, but really the head shape is the most definitive thing that can be used here in New Hampshire to recognize, you know, venomous versus non-venomous. And once again, I will emphasize the fact that it is extremely rare to find venomous species in this part of the country. They have been all but wiped out. Um, and when you find them, they're, they're very shy. So really, you know, generally speaking, the sort of worry people have about the likelihood of encountering much less getting bit by a venomous species is just hugely out of you know uh, proportion with the actual threat or presence of these snakes. So generally speaking, I mean, always, if you're in New Hampshire, you can always veer on the side of, this is not a dangerous snake. You don't have to have that sense of, oh no, is it a, is it a rattlesnake? I can guarantee you it's not, you know? Um, and, and really, that, look at the head and, you know, but, but I think that humans are so inclined to jump to the conclusion, oh, is it, is it venomous? Because again, that's our evolutionary heritage with our phobias that we have that we might have time to get into, <laughs> maybe later at the end of class. Um, oh, does that answer the question, I hope? All right. <laughs> move right along uh what time we got here we're doing okay halfway through so i want to get into turtles so i definitely want to make sure we get through our snakes here the ring neck snake uh is a beautiful small snake species uh similar to the red-bellied snake you find them in your gardens under little rocks and logs and they're another slug and snail eating species that has this beautiful um i mean not only the ring around its neck which is very distinctive and that's the only species that has that but often just gorgeous uh, orange coloration underneath its body on its tail. And it will kind of use that as uh, what's called, you know, flash uh, sort of warning. So these guys aren't venomous, they're not dangerous, but sometimes they can flash those colors as kind of a surprise to a predator. And that can be enough of a sort of a, uh, you know, sort of unexpected uh, stimulus and surprise that they can give them pause and then allow the snake to escape. And there's a lot of animals that have that all, all around the, you know, the world that will have some bright color that will suddenly, you know, pop out and then that gives it just enough of a chance to escape that, you know, due to the, the predator being a little bit surprised by it. And these guys are also widespread, but just pretty secretive. You gotta be looking around for them to find them. Um, and just one of my favorite snakes, such a beautiful one to encounter. Also very helpful to gardeners, getting rid of slugs in your, your lettuce patch or whatever. Um, 
right along here. Here are their eggs, by the way. These are egg-laying species. You can see these very tiny, leathery, elongated eggs. Uh, and you know, these snakes will lay their eggs in a, a little, little, little uh, nest and just let them hatch on their own and fend for themselves, which is the case with the vast majority of reptiles, really. Once the egg laying is done, that is the end of parental concern. There are exceptions. There are some pythons and boas that will incubate their eggs and even shiver around them. Um, and um, certainly there are uh, even, you know, crocodilians that will defend their nests and their young for, you know, so I'm not saying this is, this is a, a rule for all reptiles, but generally speaking, compared to mammals and birds, baby reptiles, when they hatch, they have all the instinct they need for independent survival. These guys are often eating salamanders too, these little uh, redback salamanders. And as we talked about, a lot of these, you know, quote unquote, non-venomous snakes do have mild venom that they've been learning more and more about from these different kinds of glands, you know, independently evolved than the vipers and the elapids. You know, but they have what's called a duvernois gland, which delivers a mild toxin to their prey. So it kind of just weakens them and reduces the struggle as they're kind of swallowing it, you know, thinking of a garter snake swallowing a live toad and as it's swallowing it and chewing this into it, it just starts to get sedated and then allows the, you know, the swallowing process to happen more easily. Um, I'm going to move in to the next one. That's a beautiful picture there of a really just gorgeous uh, colored uh, ringneck snake. And... Northern water snakes are most aggressive uh, native snake here. These guys are, they get big, they have a wide range of patterns, again, often mistaken for venomous species. And with these ones, you know, because they, they are not shy, they will, they will strike at you. And I've, I've had, I think, the worst probably snake bite ever from a uh, northern water snake, you know, trying to catch it, and they just lay into you. Uh, they are not, <laughs> they're not shy, and they get pretty darn big. Um, so they're totally common and, you know, not, not threatened at all. Um, they, you know, they really have a variable patterning, but they often, you want to look for that kind of reddish blotching coloration on them, and certainly the habitat, hanging out on a log in water by a pond, that's a really good indication that there is a, it's a northern water snake, or even out away from the pond, but you know, somewhere nearby, you should, you know, if you see a big snake, this could very likely be one, even if it's very dark, if you, you know, are able to see underneath it, which you'd have to pick it up to do so, and I don't necessarily recommend that to novices who are <laughs> wanting to learn how to catch snakes, but uh, they have that beautiful, uh, it's called the half moon kind of patterns in the belly there with the, the orange and the, the white. Uh, that's a good way to if you really want to be able to see underneath to identify it. But, you know, again, these guys, you know, sometimes they're, they're almost black and they've really confused a lot of people. I've even seen, you know, debates on blogs from professional biologists and herpetologists about whether a snake picture is a northern water snake or not, you know, and it, it can be pretty tricky. But really, I mean, they are often a snake that is misattributed to other snake species, uh, including timber rattlesnakes, including, including black racers. But um, you look for the habitat type and that's, you know, really the best indication um, of, of what it is, probably. They eat all kinds of aquatic animals, fish, frogs, salamanders, crayfish, um, you know, birds and mammals. Uh, so they, they're, they're pretty generalist. They're a very successful snake species. And uh, here's one chowing down on a fish. Once again, just testament to how amazing it is that these limbless creatures can be uh, such amazing uh, fish catchers. I mean, I, I can't catch a fish, that's for sure, without a net or a fishing pole. But these guys can just hunt them right down and swallow them whole. And uh, some of their in, uh, images there. Um, lots of predators eat them. These guys, again, very aggressive. They will musk you. They will bite you. And they also have a mild um, anticoagulant in their, their, their uh, saliva that can make you bleed a lot, maybe look a little more nasty than it is if they do bite you. But again, they, there's, even though we're talking about how these, these snakes you know, have more toxin than has been traditionally ascribed to them, it does not mean they're dangerous to the people. I mean, they have to chew on you for a long time to even get any of it in you. And the size of us versus the size of a toad, I mean, does not mean the, any of these uh, colubrid snakes are dangerous to it all, us at all. They're 100% you know, harmless, even if they bite you. If a snake bites you, if you're picking it up, you know, give, it, give it a wash off, you know, put a Band-Aid on it if you need to with some antibiotic, and you're fine. Nothing to worry about. Um, and these guys are often misidentified as copperheads and cotton mouths. I've had many people, including students, say, I mean, I know, you know, cotton mouths live here in New Hampshire. My dad saw one, my uncle saw one. And I'm like, ah, well, it was, it was a water snake. <laughs> they just, you know, cotton mouths don't live this far north. So just water snakes are often, you know, misattributed to other species, including a lot of venomous ones. 
All right, 1034, moving right along. Uh, smooth green snake. These guys, to me, are kind of like the holy grail of northeastern snakes. They're just so gorgeous and very rare to find. These guys are, are a vulnerable species and very understudied and very hard to find. They often live in, uh, you know, fields and, you know, tough habitats where you just see a little green snake sneaking around. Um, and, you know, grassy fields and pastures are often their habitat you can find them in, like, you know, kind of wet areas often, and their camouflage is fantastic in a green area. So it's just, they're, they're really tough to find. Uh, they eat lots of invertebrates, so insects and spiders and all kinds of little arthropods and stuff. Um, and I guess all I'm gonna say about these guys, they sometimes do have the communal hibernation as well with other small snakes in the winter time. They've been found with those other groups of snakes. You can see their range throughout the North American continent and New Hampshire there. Oh, by the way, just a quick little note about these, uh, these state, you know, maps. Pretty much, you see that checkerboard where you're like, okay, so they're in some, you know, uh, you know, little regions but not others. What does that mean? Well, this is just where they've been reported. So you can make a lot of inferences when you see a map like this. You know, if you see the, the, the reported, you know, blotches, then you're, they're probably going to be in between. They just haven't technically been found with an official specimen yet. You know, that's where they, how they get the information, you know, the state biologist about this. They have to have official documented specimens from each little district. So uh, you have to use kind of a little bit of inference to under, you know, in interpret these maps a little bit about where they probably are actually found. Um, but again, they're, they're a high conservation concern in the Northeast. They are definitely uh, threatened from loss of open fields, from succession and development, certainly pesticides and insecticides uh, that, you know, diminish their prey and perhaps get into them and you know, compromise their physiology as well. So uh, these, are, these are one of the snakes that is not as uh, common or um, successful right now in the Northeast. Um, and the eastern hognose snake is a really cool snake. If you've, I mean, they're more common farther south um, in the eastern U.S., uh, but they are found in New Hampshire in places. Uh, in New Hampshire, they're endangered. They're a rare snake here, but they're not endangered other parts of the U.S. farther south. Um, and these guys are just really cool. Lots of neat things about them. I mean, that little snub nose gives them their name, the hog nose snake. And uh, they, they really just have a lot of cool behaviors and habitats. You know, they, they need very sandy, gravelly soils to survive. If you want to find them in very, you know, towards the coast in New Hampshire is where you'd find them in sandier habitats. Um, they often uh, need to live near wetland habitats as well, where they, they uh, have amphibian prey. They eat a lot of toads and salamanders. Um, and these guys definitely have resistance to toxins as well, like garter snakes. Uh, you know, it's all those toads they're chowing down on. And they actually can deflate toads, which is kind of crazy, because toads puff themselves up when they're in defensive mode. And they actually have specialized teeth uh, in their upper jaw that punctures the toads and deflates them so they can swallow them more easily, like popping a balloon, basically. Um, <laughs> Also, that mild, you know, um, saliva venom that we mentioned that helps to mobilize the amphibians as they're swallowing them. And there's a pretty cute little baby hog nose there in the bottom. There's one chowing down on a toad, probably getting ready to pop it like a balloon. <laughs> um, and there's a little baby hog nose uh, hatching from its leathery shell there. Now, here's the hog nose defensive behavior, which a lot of people know. They flatten out their bodies, they hiss, and just try to make themselves look really intimidating as their first line of defense. They, you know, spread those ribs out around their head, almost like a cobra does, to look bigger and scarier. And if they, that doesn't work, they, they actually play dead. They'll roll over and emit a nasty, nasty musk, stick their tongue out, and then if you, if you flip them over, they keep flipping onto their back. Apparently, they just like, oh, I'm dead. I'm dead. No, no, seriously, I'm dead. So uh, that's that's the way they, they fool a lot of predators that way. And uh, it actually has um, a lot of them be a quite successful snake in the southern parts of the U.S., but again, threatened here in New Hampshire. Um, there, there, there's the dead, <laughs> so-called uh, you know, plain dead behavior of the snake. And I have, I have I've seen this and smelled it once. And yeah, it smells pretty gross. I mean, you can imagine a predator being like, Ugh, I'm, I'm going to look somewhere else for something else to eat. This, is, this thing's pretty far gone. <laughs> Um, and this is just kind of funny. You don't have to read this whole page here. These are all the common names across the U.S. for the eastern hognose snake. A billion names, a lot of them with like venomous connotations, adders and this and that and the other vipers. And just goes to show how uh, much, you know, sort of um, rich mythology and kind of all these, you know, sort of inaccurate information you can get from trying to hear things from, you know, like uh, just anecdotes or stories from people uh, about you know, these animals. Uh, so really, it, that's why we have scientific names. You can know what it actually is. And uh, these guys have, have a storied lore in American, I think, uh, history. So you can see all these crazy names. Where's my favorite one? There's somewhere in here that's really funny. Um, Chunkhead is pretty good. Uh, yeah, I know you can look at this later, but a lot of funny names. 
Um, so again, you can see New Hampshire where they're found there in that kind of little region around Manchester, primarily up to Concord. And actually some pretty urban areas too. So, I mean, you know, a lot of, uh, I think, uh, threats from development in their, their limited range in New Hampshire. Um, the black racer is our biggest snake in New Hampshire, and these are big black snakes, uh, very fast, very, you know, uh, intimidating if you might be, uh, you know, uh, nervous about snakes. They can get up to five feet long. They are a threatened snake. They're diurnal, very fast moving. You want to look for that uh, white throat and chin is always a helpful thing to recognize a black racer. Uh, and these guys, you know, here's a baby black racer. It goes to show that the baby forms of many snakes are very differently patterned. So as a young one, you know, young hatchling, they have that, you know, checkered model pattern, better for blending in when they're vulnerable. But as they get larger, they develop that, you know, more jet black coloration. Here's some more uh, black racer pictures there, eating all kinds of larger prey yep, in rodents and reptiles and amphibians. They're good climbers. Um, so yeah, a snake that will freak out people sometimes, but they're, they're very intelligent and very, you know, for snakes and very uh, fast moving and active hunters. Um, they're very curious snakes too. I mean, they will raise their heads to check out their surroundings. I've seen that before. You know, just kind of getting get the lay of the land, kind of like a bear would. I you know if it's standing up on its hind legs, it's just curious. It wants to see what's going on. It does not mean it's rearing up to attack you or come at you by any means. Um, and despite their, their Latin name, uh, Calubra constrictor, they're not actually constrictors. They just kind of pin their prey to the ground and then swallow them. Um, it, you know, they'll bite you if you get them. I, I've uh, caught a few of these guys and I, I, I caught couple, little one that was pretty aggressive, a big one that was, uh, I let it go pretty quick because it was very aggressive. And I found one that was super mellow. Often when you catch snakes when they're, it's cooler in the day, uh, they won't bite you because they don't have the energy yet as um, cold-blooded animals. So I think I caught that one uh, very calm black racer in the morning uh, when it was kind of colder. And these guys also will do the, the tail vibration on dead leaves as well, mimicking the rattlesnake sound. All right, so I'm gonna move on. Our timber rattlesnake is, you know, the one venomous species that we've had traditionally in New Hampshire that, as I've mentioned, is effectively extinct. It has been wiped out by human human persecution, for lack of, you know, that, that's what it is, is people don't understand them. People uh, either get rid of them because they're afraid or they get rid of them because they can make money off them. Um, so, you know, these guys are critically imperiled. They're the only venomous snake that we have in New Hampshire and very shy, beautiful snake. I've always wanted to see one. They've got different color patterns and, you know, from, from black to brown, even this bright, you know, kind of yellowish coloration, just really cool snake. That large triangular head is a distinctive feature of the viper family. So that is, you know, you can see Hopefully you get a better picture here. You can see the head just has that big wide base to it. You can see the kind of cat-like uh, pupil. You can also see the pit on its face because they're pit vipers. They can actually sense the thermal uh, radiation, the heat of their prey. So if they're sitting in pitch blackness and a mouse walks by that's warm blooded, they can sense that like all pit vipers can, which includes all rattlesnakes. Um, and these guys, with, where they're traditionally found is, i got to make sure I have time for turtles here, so I'm going to move kind of quickly here. They live, um, you know, often in south-facing hillsides where there's more sun because we're in the northern hemisphere. So, I mean, uh, right here near where I live, I mean, in Brattleboro, Vermont, there, there's a mountain called Mount, um, uh, what's it called, uh, Wantasticut. And it has, you know, a big boulder field in the south side that traditionally had a big population of timber rattlesnakes where they all would gather together and that's where they would all hibernate together too because this is kind of their, their, their Achilles heel, uh, unfortunately, is all these timber rattlesnakes, they go to the same hibernacula, the same deep rocky crevices in winter for denning up where they can avoid the frost. And then they all come out together in the spring and bask on rocks and they're sitting ducks for people that want to hunt them or kill them or sell them. And, you know, traditionally there were bounties in towns up until like the 1970s for if you brought in a rattlesnake tail that you killed, they would give you money. You know, the, the, the towns wanted to get rid of rattlesnakes. They were just considered a scourge. They were considered no good. So get rid of them. We'll pay you to get rid of them, you know? Um, and these are just very docile snakes. They're not aggressive. They want to stay out of trouble. They don't want to bother you. And people go find them where they're lying on rocks, probably in the morning when it was cold and they couldn't even you know strike to defend themselves and just take them out and nowadays the big threat is actually selling them off for the pet trade on the, the you know black market pet trade they can actually fetch quite a, a high price so the remaining uh populations that you know, I've, I've been told still do exist in a couple places in new hampshire are a, a very much guarded secret even you know where there's more hibernacula in vermont still a well-guarded secret um 
you know, because they don't want the word to get out for these kind of vigilante snake hunter guys to go and just take out the rest of the population to sell on the, on the black market. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the new source of uh, income for these, you know, snake hunters. It's not from the government nowadays, luckily, but, you know, still a big problem. So, I mean, I could go on about, you know, timber rattlesnakes. They're, they're amazing snakes. I mean, they have amazing social behavior. They're snakes that they've been proven to recognize individuals that are related to them, you know, have these migrations every year, you know, following pheromones, males to females, and just a fascinating animal that is very misunderstood and you know unfortunately it's been just really persecuted here in the northeast um they're also great rodent hunters you know they're eating all kinds of small rodents and mammals and other things um and they're also a live birth giver and you're gonna see in the spring all these different color schemes of, of all the same species timber rattlesnakes that are all coming out of their hibernacula just because those are the best places for them all to hibernate together to get away from the frost so they're, they'll all be coming out in mass in the spring and then coming together in the fall same thing they always have fidelity to the same hibernation sex they'll, they'll, they'll migrate and travel every year to find food and mate and then come back every fall to the same hibernation hibernation site. So if, if, you know, if a hibernation site is wiped out due to a construction project, well, that's it. That, that's it for all those rattlesnakes because they don't have the ability to find other hibernation chambers. And really, it's, it's, that is the limited sort of element to their, their habitat, really, um, is finding those deep crevices here in the north anyway, uh, where they can escape the, the frost in the winter. Um, so I'm going to move right ahead. I got the rattles, you know, again, for just scaring away predators, scaring away big animals. They don't want to bite you. They're trying to stay to themselves. Quite shy animals. Um, and there's their total range. So across the U.S., you know, they're, they're certainly not um, threatened everywhere in their range, you know, but I mean, they're certainly misunderstood and persecuted, I would say, everywhere in their range, like all rattlesnakes are. And you can see there's little outlying populations that are threatened here and there, and including right here in New Hampshire, where we only have, you know, I mean, I would say that the map here is probably an older map that really doesn't, you know, show how limited we think they probably are right now. Um, so there again, different color schemes and just, you know, there's a lot of stories you can talk about with timber rattlesnakes and, you know, how, actually I'll recommend a book to you. I'll send a link to this later. It's called America's Snake by a guy named Ted Levin, who's a, a sort of writer and biologist in Vermont. And, you know, he's friends with some of my mentors at the Harris Center and wrote a fantastic book about the history of the timber rattlesnake in the U.S. And if you're interested, I'll send you a link to that book later. Um, so, you know, kind of as a summary, the future of vulnerable and endangered snakes is in our hands in New Hampshire. Uh, most of them are, I mean, all of them are really harmless, even, you know, these ones that have been sort of uh, feared throughout most of their history. And really, uh, I, I firmly believe that understanding them and appreciating them for what they really are, it can really help change the collective understanding of these animals that are just so uh, reviled unnecessarily. So I hope you all can, whatever it takes to, you know, share, share whatever new knowledge or understanding you have with your, you know, family or friends or people that just might have just very limited ideas of what snakes are and, you know, very uh, unfortunately kind of, you know, uh, fearful or, or hateful ideas about them. I mean, I hope, hope you can spread the word best you can. So everyone, I'm going to jump right into turtles. I'm not even going to waste any time because I want to make sure we can do that before we're done today. Um, I'm, as I'm transitioning, I'm going to open it up for any uh, questions that might have come up. Yeah, we got a question that just came in. Great. What often defines a species of snake if the colors are so different? Okay, so I mean, the, the term species is a human construct. It is something that you know scientists came up with to try to make sense of the natural world. There's no real existence of a species in nature. I mean, the idea that we have is that you have a population of organisms that is unable to reproduce with other closely related organisms and have viable offspring. You know what I mean? So they're, they're just too genetically different through the course of evolution. And you know, over the as two species, you know, you would say diverge or radiate. You know, for a little while, they're in two populations that are somehow you know isolated either geographically or even behaviorally, and they stop reproducing together. And then you have genetic drift or different selection pressures in two areas and little by little those populations change genetically over the course of evolution and the different you know uh, uh, selection pressures in that area they have and then eventually they, they they're no longer the same species and if they meet up they don't have the same behavior and they don't have the same genetics and even if they tried to mate they can't have viable offspring but nature is full of examples of all these different things that just thwart our ideas of what a species is so i mean in the, i don't want to get too into it uh, but in the course of snakes i mean certainly we have you know like from a baby snake to an adult snake that changes coloration and that's certainly absolutely the same species. Uh, but then, you know, thinking about timber rattlesnakes or garter snakes that just have different color morphs and variations in, in how they look, that can be quite dramatic. I mean, back to the, uh, you know, the, this, this um, 
look at all these different timber rattlesnakes. These are, you know, I mean, this idea of a person with brown hair or, or blonde hair, basically, you know, like they're entirely, you know, compatible species. They can have, you know, viable offspring. It's just these different little, um, you know, genetic variations that happen within a population. So hope that answers the question. <laughs> I'm going to move right into turtles. Where is it here? All right. Turtles. Let's jump right in from the start. So these are, there's going to be a lot less uh, detail in these slides. And like I mentioned, I will, you know, I send this to you, uh, fill in some of, some of the things I'm talking about so you can be reminded of it. But I'm kind of mostly just going to show some images and, and talk about things and hopefully that'll allow us to fit in uh, with the rest of the time we have. And I don't mean to short shrift turtles by any means. I feel like I've spent most of this time on snakes. Turtles, you know, fascinating group of animals. I love them so much. And let's see how much we can get into them right now. Um, so different reptile order, Testudines, and, you know, the oldest living lineage of reptiles. Uh, they've changed very little in 230 million years from the oldest fossils we've found. So they have a successful, you know, sort of uh, strategy and, and physiological uh, sort of, uh, you know, thing going on with their shell. They all do have those protective bony shells that is made from the skeleton. Uh, I showed you showed you that you know sea turtle shell I have. I also have a little box turtle shell I'll show you before we're done today that does show really how it is just fused ribs and vertebrae that protects them. And we've got the two parts of the shell. The upper shell is called the carapace and the lower shell is called the plastron for some fancy turtle vocab for you there. Um, no turtles have teeth. All turtles have evolved horny jaw ridges instead, and that's still pretty good strategy. We still have, you know, turtles that are very good predators that can just, you know, check, you know, to kill fish and other prey items, and turtles that are um, herbivores that can, you know, chew on berries and plants too. So uh, that was just a way um, to, I think, simplify their skull and probably allow it to fit into their shell more uh, compactly and not have all those extra teeth as a sort of um, you know, sort of limitation to being able to, you know, hide inside of a shell. All turtles have very strong limbs, whether it's a tortoise on land keeping its big shelled body, you know, walking along, or a sea turtle with those powerful uh, paddle limbs for paddling around. All turtles lay eggs on lands, even the entirely aquatic species, because of their shared ancestry of being reptiles. Reptile eggs cannot, um, you know, survive in the water. They need to have access to open oxygen because all turtle rel uh, ancestors, excuse me, were terrestrial. So even the most aquatic sea turtles have to crawl on land to lay their eggs. Um, mother turtles, for the most part, will lay their eggs in nest chambers. They'll pretty much dig it into the ground. Most all turtles will do that. But that's basically the end of their parental uh, involvement because the hatchlings, once they hatch, they're on their own. And really, once they're, they're laid, they're on their own. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no example of a baby turtle following its mother to learn how to swim or how to forage or anything like that. Same with snakes. Um, you know, really, it's, it's, they have all the instinct they need to be entirely independent from the very beginning. Um, many of turtle species have what's called temperature-dependent sex determination, or TSD. A lot of you might have heard of that. Basically, it is the temperature of the uh, nest determines how many males versus females you have. Um, and that is something that, you know, they've done research on about how even, you know, in crocodilians, mothers can even, uh, you know, build up their nests, different, you know, layers of, of composting material to change the temperature if there's more or less, you know, males or females in the environment. It, there's a lot we don't understand about it, but um, it is an issue with climate change, unfortunately, um, with some of these reptile species. Um, you know, all crocodilians have this, and many turtles have this, some lizards too, and basically the idea is if you have warmer climates, you're going to have an imbalance of only one gender, and it's different depending on the species, you know, whether you have more males or females when it gets warmer um, but it's all about you know what what hormones are produced during the the embryo phase based on the temperature and it's, it's a combination of genetics and environment um, and you know it's, it's pretty interesting but it's definitely an issue with um, one reason turtles could be vulnerable to climate change We've got our two major turtle groups around the world. We've got our cryptodirans, which is most turtles that you know of. And they have what's called the cobra-like bending of the neck vertebrae, kind of like, like a snake or a you know, great blue heron. Imagine the neck kind of curling into the shell that way in a sort of vertical orientation. And that's sea turtles, tortoises, all our, our local turtles that we have here are all in this group, the cryptodirans. But you also have the pleurodirans in other parts of the world. And these are sometimes called the snake neck turtles that have this sort of sideways movement of their neck. And they can 
can't pull their heads entirely into their shell. They just kind of tuck it under the, the ridge of their shell. So not quite as uh, well protected. And um, they're found in definitely in Australia, other parts of Southeast Asia, and actually South America and Southern Africa too. They're an ancient lineage. And actually they're, they're one of the groups of, of organisms that gave um, you know, evidence towards the uh, continental drift theory. They found them in such different parts of the world and they realized you know, they weren't good at swimming across oceans. They realized, hey, they probably had a common ancestor that was when these continents were connected. Uh, other organisms have helped us with that information too. Um, here's an eastern snake neck turtle from Australia. So just goes to show, you know, they're, they're pretty cool looking turtles. Someone sent me some, some message about some you know, internet site about warn, warning about them being invasive or something. I don't know. I, I, I researched it and they're, they're definitely not. I mean, these, these are mostly vulnerable uh, threatened turtles in most parts of their, their range, um, and certainly in Australia and other parts of the world, uh, these snake necked or side neck turtles. Let's go through our native turtle species. And I mean, I'll, I'm probably gonna go over 11 o'clock today. So if you need to go early, I totally understand. And uh, I'll make this all available to you. But I'm trying to fit in everything I promised for you here. So uh, we've got our Eastern painted turtles, Blanding's turtles, common musk turtles, spotted turtles, wood turtles, Eastern box turtles, and snapping turtles are our New Hampshire species. And Eastern painted turtle is the most familiar turtle, the most commonly encountered one. And if you go out, you know, hiking and you see some turtles hanging out on a log, I can almost guarantee they're going to be Eastern painted turtles. Uh, but a beautiful species. I mean, you can see why they get the name. Um, it's a very cool freshwater species. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things I can say about them. Um, they, you know, like most turtles, they hibernate uh, down in the winter in the water, in the mud, just entirely submerged. And they are able to, this is kind of interesting, breathe through their anus <laughs> uh, during the, the winter, get a little bit of oxygen through the water, through their anal membrane. So with kids, I call it the butt snorkel. You know, other turtles do that too. But uh, turtles, you know, in North uh, northeast do need to get down and hibernate in the winter. All of our native reptiles do. And turtles, as opposed to snakes, tend to find aquatic places to hibernate where it's muddy and they can pretty much stay submerged for the entire winter and still get enough oxygen to survive because of their low, low metabolism rates. Oh, also I'm going to show you, because I don't have enough information, I'll reward you with baby turtle pictures. So here's a baby, uh, you know, painted turtle there. Pretty darn cute. The Blanding's turtle is our most threatened turtle in New Hampshire, and a very beautiful turtle with this distinctive yellow neck. Um, there's a lot of conservation projects. The Harris Center is interested in becoming involved with some conservation, perhaps even captive rearing projects with these turtles. They're doing things with um, you know, conservation organizations in partnership with public schools, raising Blanding turtles in Massachusetts, and we're hoping eventually we can do that too. We're still in the early stages of trying to figure out what that will look like with the legal implications, et cetera. Um, but but these are amazing turtles and not commonly found here in New Hampshire. They are critically imperiled in the state. And here's a baby one. Aww. Moving right along. A common musk turtle, one of my favorite turtles. These guys are often, you know, I'll, I'll catch them sometimes in nets when I'm netting for macro invertebrates. They're, they're very aquatic. They live in kind of the muddy bottoms of ponds and things. They got these big kind of chunky looking heads. And as the name suggests, they do emit a funky smell. It gives them their name, the musk turtle when they are uh, threatened. So they're, they're a pretty you know, common species, not commonly encountered because of how aquatic they are, but you definitely will find them not uncommonly, especially if you're a fisher person or you know, doing any netting or anything like that in a lake or a pond, you'll find these common musk turtles. There's a baby. Aww. The spotted turtle. These are another beautiful native species. These ones are also less, not as threatened, but less commonly encountered. They need kind of specific types of marshy habitats to survive. Um, there, there is um, a habitat of, the, uh, sorry, a population of them that has been found uh, in Keene, kind of right near downtown Keene, New Hampshire, if any of you are living around there in the um, Ashuelo Park, that they definitely have the right kinds of marshy habitats there with, you know, kind of uh, reeds and grasses and, um, you know, wetlands kind of areas. It's a good habitat for spotted turtles. But you can see why they have their name, that very distinctive black carapace with the little yellow spots, almost like little stars on their, their backs and just beautiful orange coloration on their their legs and heads there. Um, oh, I don't know why that milk snake got in there. <laughs> and there are baby spotted turtles there. So uh, just very cool little uh, native species there. Let's talk about, oops, the wood turtle. This is 
just an amazing turtle. And I've been really wanting to see one of these. I have not seen one in the wild yet, but I, I really hope, hope to find one. Uh, <laughs> picture on the top is kind of a funny one of the mating wood turtle. Um, but they have this you know, really um, you know, distinctive appearance, kind of a flat, dark shell, and then that bright orange coloration on their legs and their necks. And wood turtles are kind of known to potentially be the most intelligent uh, native turtle we have here, based on observations on captive situations where you know, they, they've been able to you know, really like learn all these details about where they're living. I mean, I sent you an article this morning that I recommend you read with little cool quotes about different native turtle species and um, it was talking a little bit about the wood turtle in captivity how you know one example it learned to associate you know going to the kitchen was time to eat and going to the bathroom was time to take a bath you know and uh, turtles really are more personable and I think from anecdotal uh, things I've experienced and read about, more intelligent maybe, or aware at least, of, of human things going on than other reptiles are. And the cool uh, behavior they have in the wild, they've been observed to actually thump on the ground, on the soil with their, with their um, feet, their front feet, to mimic the sound of a rainstorm, the vibrations that causes earthworms to come out of the soil, and then they chow down on them. So here is, I don't picture the when eating worms there, but um, John about handling turtles. Is there yeah. any issue with salmonella or not? It, not unless you put them in your mouth. <laughs> and uh, you know the whole the whole thing with salmonella. I mean, the, the big scare was back when the you know the um, red eared sliders became really common turtle in the pet trade, and there were some little tiny ones that kids would put in their mouths, and you know would get salmonella occasionally. I and mean, there's a lot of things with salmonella in the environment. You know, it's not just turtles. I mean, I think turtles got a bad rap from that whole kind of thing in the media back in the day, and they you know outlawed tiny turtles that were small enough to put in your mouth. But salmonella is all over the place. I mean, it's in the environment everywhere, and really don't worry about picking up a turtle, just wash your hands. I mean, you know, it's always a good practice to wash your hands after handling any wild animal. Um, but yeah, you don't have, unless you're, yeah, immediately, uh, you know, contacting your mouth or a little kid is putting a turtle in their mouth. There's, there's no danger of that. Um, here's a baby wood turtle. Aww. Snapping turtles, I mean, everybody knows these guys are our most iconic kind of turtle. And I, I just love snapping turtles. I mean, they're just such cool animals, really like, living fossils. I mean, th th really, th they are one of the few animals that has lived in North America since before the comet killed the dinosaurs. There were common snapping turtles that looked effectively the same, and they survived the comet, and they are still here. There are very few animals in North America that they can find evidence of living here before that comet just wiped things out 65 million years ago all across the world, and certainly our continent. The comet, if you don't know, hit right around the Gulf of Mexico, around Yucatan, so in North America was ground zero, and uh, most things just were decimated but these guys are tough they are just incredibly hardy animals and really they look like dinosaurs and they've been doing their thing for millions of years right here in north america um even you know over probably 100 million years and uh they you know are common on roads i mean i i always help them off the road when i see them a lot of people ask me about that you know and about well, what do you do with the sea turtle on the road I would say, I mean, definitely be safe. You know, don't don't be silly about, you know, stopping and causing an accident or getting hit by a car. But, you know, if you can safely, there are ways to help a turtle across the road. You know, pulling over and even a snapping turtle, if you, you can see the picture there, if you get them by the back of the shell, you can safely transport them across the road in the direction they're going. You know, give them a little nudge even, just kind of like a little lawnmower if you want to just kind of nudge them across the road. Or you can pick them up. Don't grab the tail, that's not good for them, but the back of the shell, and they can't reach you if you hold the very back of the carapace. Um, quick funny story is uh, once I was out with kids with, and we found a snapping turtle, about the size of the one, the picture there, and it was pretty aggressive. It was it was trying to snap and get me, and uh, you know I was picking it by the shell to show them, and they saw a big leech on its neck behind its head, and they're like, you gotta take it off. And I'm like, oh guys, come on, it's just part of nature. You know, leeches happen, it's not gonna hurt the turtle. And they were like, we thought you loved animals. You have to take the leech off. So they convinced me to like get a stick, and as this turtle is thrashing and snapping, I was able to kind of push this leech off its neck just so I could hold standing in the eyes of my students and uh, they thought I was a hero so I guess it was worth it you know but um <laughs> anyway uh, snapping turtles just amazing animals um you know they're going out and nesting this time of year finding sandy habitats often in places that aren't so good um you know sometimes sides of roads and you know places where it's not not great uh viability for survival uh they'll actually, actually lay false nests too because most snapping turtle nests are actually predated by by native mammals you know uh, foxes and skunks and raccoons and all kinds of things will will eat um baby turtles and in general you know baby turtles most don't survive most do get eaten from the egg phase all the way up through um you know their young adulthood so that's one of the reasons these captive rearing programs can be helpful it's just given baby 
baby turtle uh, sort of head start, getting through the most vulnerable phase of their life and avoiding getting eaten by something and then letting them go when they're a bit older. Uh, but snapping turtles actually will lay false nests. They'll dig multiple holes, not all of them with eggs, to throw off predators and confuse them. So not all the times you see a snapping turtle digging means it's laying its eggs. It might actually be one of those uh, sort of false nests to throw off the uh, egg-eating mammals that might be around. And there are some baby snapping turtles. They're just my favorites. Uh, they're just such cool little mini dinosaurs. Baby turtles, I mean, just totally, you know, you can find one, you can check it out, you can pick it up. And really, you know, as I've said, um, reptiles, you know, you have to learn how to be safe and, you know, smart about picking them up. But, you know, if you know it's not a timber rattler and you know how to be smart, if it's a, if it's a snapping turtle, there's none that are going to hurt you, you know, um, and they're not ever going to go out of their way to hurt you. So it's really a matter of just how to have a little bit of knowledge and just kind of be smart and safe. And you can help turtles off roads. You can pick up snakes if you want to, you know, um, it's just uh, a matter of learning little by little. And I would say, you know, with snakes, especially um, the idea of if, you, if you're nervous about them, you know, baby steps, the idea of you find find a little little baby, you know, uh, whatever, you find a ring neck snake in your, your garb, then you can pick that up and check that out and just, you know, that can help erode some of that just knee-jerk fear that a lot of people have about snakes. And, you know, snapping turtles too. I mean, not everyone needs to pick up a snapping turtle, but uh, they're, they're certainly not going to go out of their way to hurt you. And you can help them out when they're crossing roads and certainly observe them and just such a wonderful native species that we have here. So, so everyone, I'm, I'm going to open it up now for our final time, for any, any final questions. I wanted to make a quick plug too that um, we are interested in photos of plastron, which is I guess like a fingerprint. And so if we do, if you do see turtles squashed on the road, which happens quite mm -hmm. frequently, uh, if you take a picture of the plastron and send it into the Harris Center, we're interested in that information. Um, but we also got a, a question in that someone helped a snapper across the road a couple of days ago, and it had already been struck in the Caribbean yeah. tract. Um, he was thinking, uh, or she was thinking about gluing it with super glue. Is that a nutty idea? Uh, it, you know, it's not as nutty as it might sound, to be honest. Uh, because first of all, turtles and reptiles in general can survive like what would be just fatal, you know, injuries to other animals. They're they're pretty incredible what they can survive. And I've seen snakes and I've seen turtles that are just like, how are you alive right now with, with this injury that you're carrying with you? So, you know, um, it's not to say there aren't internal injuries that, that might, you know, be fatal eventually, but, um, you know, if, if you find... <laughs> Look it up. Don't take my word for super glue. I've never done that, and I've never. I'm not going to say go and super glue a turtle back together. But what I will say is, um, there are some very cool examples of how turtles have been rehabilitated when they've been injured. If you want to find you know, on, online, there's you know uh, pictures and videos of turtles that have had wheels super glued on them when they've lost their legs or had shell injuries to help them crawl. And it, it is possible, but I'm going to say don't don't take my word for it. Do some research, uh, and you know there, there, there's some cool examples of how turtles have been rehabilitated, and there's some rehabilitators in the state. Certainly fish and wildlife might be a good um, way, way to kind of, you know, uh, inquire about that. What you, what you can do or how, where you could take it maybe to help, help it out. But sometimes they can just survive and, and heal up on their own, to be honest, even though it looks pretty nasty sometimes to our eye. Yeah, so any other questions here? That's all that's in the chat right now, if anybody wants okay. to. Okay, well, I, I do have a, a box turtle shell here. Uh, when I was a, a boy, I did have a couple of box turtles, Shelby and Sebastian, and uh, box turtles are very cool turtles. Here's the carapace here. It's missing one of the scutes, so you can see the kind of bone underneath it there. And you can, once again, see how it is definitely part of the skeleton. You can see the uh, signs of the vertebrae and the rib cage there on this uh, box turtle shell. Box turtles are a cool species because they've actually evolved a hinge on the bottom part, the plastron. So if you've ever seen a box turtle that's nervous, it goes, it kind of hisses as it coils its neck in, lets its air out of its lungs, pulls its legs in, and then actually can seal up the plastron of its shell with a little hinge for an entirely closed off, uh, you know, kind of secure uh, position just to wait out whatever threat might be around. And um, that's how they get the name, box turtle there. And I do have one more time. I know we saw this the first class, but here is a... Uh, from the hair center, a sea turtle carapace of, I'm not quite sure, probably a green turtle. It has a kind of a strange asymmetry to with what it grew, but uh, just such a cool example, but once again, of the um, skeletal nature of the shell there. How long so do everyone, turtles live? What's that? How long do turtles live? Oh, great. You know, I'm glad you asked that. I, I was going to get into that. You know, so the oldest known turtle, I'll include this in the presentation when I beef up some of these slides a little bit before I send it to you. The oldest known turtle is still alive, and it's a tortoise that is 188 years old at least. It is a Seychelles Island giant tortoise named Jonathan. And back in, I think, 1886, they collected it from its 
native island on the Seychelles. And according to documents and even photos, it was a mature specimen. Then. So they've been able to kind of infer, okay, it had to be at least 50 years old then. And now it's still alive, hanging out, you know, in this new island. Uh, they actually moved it to this like Prince's Island in the sort of Atlantic, South Pacific. St. Martin Islands. But anyway, yeah, so they're the oldest living uh, vertebrates. And we don't really know how old turtles can live, but uh, sea turtles and tortoises and even box turtles and snapping turtles can easily live over 100 years old, no problem. And uh, lots of other turtles can too. It's kind of that slow uh, metabolism, slow pace of life. Is there a way to sex turtles? There is for some species, but not for all species. For some species, if you look at the plastron, the males will have a little sort of indentation uh, that actually helps them to mount the females during mating uh, so they don't fall off. And there's some, some other shell characteristics depending on the species that can help you determine the, the sex, but you kind of have to know what kind of turtle you're talking about. Um, any other, I'm trying to think of any other cool final turtle facts I want to share with you guys or any, if by any means any last questions you guys want to jump in um oh I'll, I'll mention uh the largest turtle in the world is the heaviest reptile the le leatherback sea turtle and they I think the record is uh 1500 pounds for a full-grown uh leatherback sea turtle that's a pretty big turtle <laughs> and let's see some anecdotes here that there was a snapper in Francistown that they estimated to be a hundred years old. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, snappers, I, I, I would guarantee snappers can live quite more than a hundred. You know, it's, it's hard to know how old they are when you find them. It's not like you can count their, I mean, some turtles you can use apparently the, the rings on their scutes on their shell to some degree, but it's not like a tree ring on a tree where you can just count it and know the age just really specifically. You kind of have to know the species and how often they'll grow those rings. So there's ways to estimate and infer based on size and other shell characteristics. But uh, I mean, we there, there are some, what we do know about how long they can live really just goes to show that they're, they're very long lived animals and, you know, definitely the longest lived terrestrial vertebrates that we have uh, in the world. If someone has a pet turtle that escapes, do you think it would survive in the wild? Depends if it's a native species or not and what kind of habitat it's in, you know, I mean, uh, if you have, uh, gosh, you know, I mean, painted I mean, yeah, again, it totally depends. So if it's a native species and it's, you know, an area where the right kind of habitat is around, yeah, probably could be fine. You want to be careful it's a, if it's a red-eared slider. Unfortunately, they're, you know, a turtle that has become an invasive species around a lot of the, the U.S. because they were so common in the pet trade and people have let them go. And then they've started taking over ponds and lakes all across the U.S. And then they become, uh, you know, very competitive and start to outcompete native species. And there's, there's some parts of the South where that's a real big problem. Not as big up here in New Hampshire, but uh, don't just let go your pet turtle if you don't quite know what's going on or, you know, what it is or if it can survive. But if it's, a, you know, again, native species, the right habitats around, yeah, it could survive. So just a lot of thank yous coming in, John. I think that's probably quite good. You packed a lot into this hour. <laughs> I hope, hope it was uh, the right pace for everyone. But uh, thanks so much for attending, everyone. It was really uh, a pleasure to share all this information with you. And I hope you all learned some new things. I hope you found some cool things you can share with your family and friends. And again, I just think these animals just deserve a lot of respect and understanding. And, uh, you know, such a cool part of our, our local biodiversity. And I hope you all appreciate that and uh, share things. Good, good cocktail party conversation when that becomes possible again. Vir virtual cocktail conversation. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. And all questions are over. I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. And thanks so much again for being part of this. And hopefully there'll be more of these uh, ESI courses online in the future. So stay tuned on the Harris Center's website for more cool stuff coming up. Bye, everybody. <laughs>